So patient assessment is normally in the pre-hospital world is broken into uh, a couple of different things. We break things into primary surveys, which are, uh, which are pretty fast off the gun. Uh, 60 seconds or less normally is what we like. Um, in a lot of cases, primary surveys take less than 10 or 15 seconds. Um, and ABCs and critical interventions, part of your primary surveys looking at ABCs, looking at what critical interventions need to take place uh, with a patient uh, immediately to sustain life for the next few minutes and then doing those, right? We're not talking about primary surveys tonight. We're just, uh, we're skimming over them fairly quickly here. After your primary survey, we get the secondary surveys. What's the difference between secondary surveys and primary surveys? Well, there's a few. Um, primary, or sorry, secondary surveys are uh, more focused. They are more detailed, significantly more detailed. And they're done with the intent of obtaining a relevant clinical history about your patient, right? So you're looking to, to really dig down. We've got someone who we've, we've done our critical interventions with. We've, uh, we've established that they're, they're not going to hopefully die in the next few minutes. And we're going to work on what we need to do to, uh, to, to really figure out and dig into what's going on. Secondary surveys, in turn, are broken down into a few different things. They're broken down into uh, sample history, right? We're going to talk about that, what that is in a sec. They're broken down to taking vital signs, doing a head to toe and or a functional inquiry. We're gonna talk a lot about our head to toe and functional inquiry. In fact, that's the majority of what we're doing tonight. Um, management and treatment. So what are you as a first aider or a pre-hospital healthcare professional gonna to do to manage, your, you manage and treat your patient in the field? Uh, what are you gonna do while you're waiting for paramedics or EMS or other resources to show up? And then how are you gonna hand over your patient to those higher level of care resources when they arrive or when you get them to the higher level of care. So again, most of tonight is management and treatment, uh, or pardon me, most of tonight is head to toe, functional inquiry and hand over to, uh, to EMS. So uh, starting right at the top, secondary survey, or sorry, sample history, the first part of secondary surveys that we're gonna be talking about. This should be review for everyone. This is uh, MFR standard content. So everyone should have seen this before, I hope. Uh, sample history includes uh, assessing signs and symptoms of your patient. So uh, take a second, guys. Think about the difference between signs and symptoms. Signs are things that you as a, uh, as a clinician are able to see. Symptoms are things that your patient complains about that you can't necessarily see directly. Um, all right. Bleeding is a sign. Pain is a symptom, right? Um, we do talk about how to assess uh, signs and symptoms, uh, and specifically pain and discomfort. Uh, I see, Susanna, it's a standard for, yeah, so sample is, a, is, is standard across many, many things, um, not, just, uh, not just the MFR, just saying that because that's sort of the standard for us, right? So it's just recognizing this, I think most of the people in the room have gotten MFR done at some point. Um, so uh, including low tarp and OPQRST, these are both mnemonics uh, that we use to talk about how to assess pain or discomfort or symptoms. Um, and you could say symptoms in general, I guess, though I find uh, low tarp and OPQRST to be most useful to assess, uh, to assess pain. Um, we're going to talk about those and review those in a sec as well. Second, uh, the second letter of sample, allergies. So we're one, we want to establish what allergies a patient has. Um, what are they allergic to? And specifically, what happens if we expose them to their allergen? If someone has an anaphylactic reaction to medical adhesive, I'd like to know that before I start sticking Band-Aids on them. Um, I've never actually seen someone who's anaphylactic to medical adhesive, but as an example, I hope you guys take the point. Um, medications, we want to find out what medications a patient takes. Um, and we do this for a couple of reasons. One, because that can impact uh, what we're doing with the patient. And... Uh, um, two, because knowing what medications our patient is on can actually give us a little bit of information about our patient's medical history in some ways and with some big caveats, um, uh, but can let us know for patients who are not great historians and not great about telling us themselves what, uh, um, what, their, uh, um, what their medical history actually is, we can, uh, we can establish some of that from their medications list. Past history, so what medical problems do they have? And again, if we're not getting this from medications, hopefully we can get this from a past history. Um, their last meal, their last hospital visit, right? When was the last time you ate? This is important if we're gonna be doing certain procedures when they're you know, where the patient might be um, in hospital later on, might be sedated later to, to reduce a fracture or dislocation, for example. Uh, their last hospital visit can tell us a lot about uh, you know, what they were, or if 
they can tell us why they were in hospital, can maybe tell us a little bit about, uh, uh, about uh, you know, what other medical challenges they might have. Um, and events leading up to what what brought us to our uh, what brought us to our encounter with uh, St. John or, or other pre-hospital healthcare folks tonight or today. Um, so these things are all you know pretty important things. They're pretty key things. There's not much in your sample history that you can just disregard or not pay attention to. Um, I'm just going to do a quick review of low tarp and OPQRST for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, with these two mnemonics. They really evaluate very, very similar things in terms of patient symptomology. They're most commonly used for pain, very often used for cardiac chest pain or ischemic chest pain. Um, low TARP uh, is, I'd be cautious to call it a standard, um, but it is very, very commonly used in higher levels of care. OPQRST is, I would say, less commonly used in higher levels of care. Um, it doesn't really matter which one you use as long as you're getting the information, uh, as long as you're getting the information from them, right? So low TARP, we start with, look, and again, this is being used to evaluate, let's, as an example, say something like chest pain. Um, you know, location, is the pain retrosternal? Is it radiating to the left? Or is it, uh, is it off to one side? Is it in the abdomen? Um, the onset of the pain, um, when did it start? Did it come on gradually? Did it come on slowly? The type of pain, is it sharp, dull, cold, squeezing? Um, this can be applied as well to uh, some patients who say, well, I don't have any pain. I have a, a, a squeezing or a pressure. Well, we can still use the same tool. We can still use low tarp or PQRST to assess that. Uh, timing, is the pain constant? Is it coming and going? Um, does anything make it better or worse? Does anything aggravate it? Does it, have, uh, does it radiate anywhere? Does it radiate to the left, the right, up, down? off to an arm. Uh, does anything make it feel better, give you relief? Um, and precipitating events, what was happening before this pain started or before this discomfort or sensation started? Um, moving on from that to something a little bit more familiar to the MFR crowd, uh, OPQRST is the mnemonic uh, that's standardized into the MFR program. OPQRST measures uh, effectively the same thing, onset provo provocation and palliation of the pain, what makes it worse, what makes it better. Um, what's the quality? What does it feel like? Where is the pain? Does it radiate anywhere? How severe is the pain? Is it 6 out of 10, 8 out of 10? We don't really have the severity built into the low tarp. It's just sort of a bolted on thing. So maybe this is, maybe this means OPQRST is more helpful to some folks to remember that. Um, and the time of onset and the timing. So when did the pain start and is it, is it coming and going, right? All this stuff should be review. Um, I, I'm just including this here so people are familiar with what low tarp is and what it means because we do talk about it a little bit farther into uh, into this evening's talk. So after a sample history, we take vital signs. I'm not going to go down a rabbit hole of vital signs tonight, guys. Um, terribly sorry. Um, we do want to uh, we do want to make sure that we're recording vital signs every five minutes or fifteen minutes as appropriate. So, depending on how sick you think your patient is, how unstable or stable you think your patient is, every five or fifteen minutes. Do we expect you to hit that five or fifteen minutes every single time? Realistically, probably not. Should you be able to do vital signs Q five or every five minutes? You yeah, probably. If you're if you're if you're so slow with your vital signs that you're taking more than five minutes to take a full set. Maybe that's a skill to work on, right? That's something we see a lot of folks who are new to pre-hospital first aid, pre-hospital healthcare uh, uh, work on getting up to speed on because there's a lot going on, right? Um, try to keep a note of your patient's most recent set of vital signs. And by keep a mental note, I mean, just inside your head. A at any given time in an ideal perfect world if everything else is going great, you should know roughly what your patient's blood pressure is. You should know roughly what their heart rate is. Um, you should have a pretty good idea of where their GCS is. Um, if you've taken a temperature or a sugar or respiratory rate, all these things, you should have a pretty solid idea. Do we need you to be able to spout off the exact numbers every single second and, and you know, put you on the spot and be like, quick, all the vital signs go? No. But it's a pretty good idea to, to find a way to mentally cache that information, right? Comes up, uh, it, you know, when we start to do further and more detailed assessments. Uh, can be very, very handy for you to be able to recall that information a little bit uh, more effortlessly. Um, with vital signs, some of the most uh, important things that we want to, uh, to pay attention to are trends, right? So if someone's heart rate is slowly increasing or slowly decreasing, if their respiratory rate 
is uh, gradually creeping up if their level of consciousness, their GCS and their Glasgow Coma Scale score is gl gradually trending down or trending up, um, especially over periods of you know, 15, 20, 30, 45 minutes. Um, those are really, really important things to note, right, with vitals. Um, don't cut corners. What is, uh, I'm not gonna ask people to raise their hands here, but what is, what is the most commonly fudged vital sign? probably respiratory rate. It's very easy to say, ah, they're breathing effectively, their respirate is 16. I'm going to suggest that that's probably, and I'm fully guilty of this myself, um, almost every paramedic uh, and other healthcare professional I know has been guilty of this at multiple times, but it's not great practice. It's not best practice. Um, please don't cut corners. Similarly, um, um, you know, don't don't fudge numbers. Don't be like, oh, I'm pretty sure it's a regular heart rate without actually palpating it. For example, if you're using pulse oximetry, um, not pupil reactions for for fudged vitals. I gotta be honest, no. I, I I'm I, I try to be pretty diligent, at least for myself, um, with with pupillary reactions. Certainly depending on uh, certainly depending on what's going wrong with my patient or what I'm worried about is happening with my patient. Um, you know, if, if I'm not assessing them, I might not check them, but I think a lot of people probably fudge, uh, pl fudge their respiratory rates. Um, do pay attention to unusual or unexpected things when you're doing vital signs. And again, this is uh, um, uh, probably goes without saying, I think, but uh, and, and some degree of familiarity and comfort and having a, a lot of experience taking vitals and seeing lots of patients goes towards helping people with this. But, but be aware of uh, be aware of what's unusual. You know, if you've taken someone's uh, taken someone's vitals and they have a heart rate of 130, try and figure out why. Is it because they just finished running a marathon? Is it because they're uh, using stimulant drugs? Is it because they're anxious? Is it because they have a cardiac event happening? Right. Um, things that are unusual or stick out beg for explanations, and part of your job is to try and figure out. Uh, either figure out what those explanations might be, or at least rule out some common causes of, of things that could cause, as, a, as an example, an elevated heart rate, for example, right? Um, high blood pressure, irregular heart rate. And irregular heart rate's another one um, that, that's very common, especially in folks over, uh, over 55, 60 or so. Um, uh, a lot of people have atrial fibrillation. It's not problematic. They take medications for it. If you find someone with an irregular heart rate, however, make sure you ask them if they have, have been diagnosed with an irregular heart rate before and if they take any medications for it. If they have not been, and if they're not taking any medications, that becomes a pertinent piece of their history that you're gonna to wanna to pass on, right? And finally, altered LOC. So we wanna know if someone has a, a GCS of 15 or if they're a 356 or 256 or, or whatever, they, whatever they happen to be. Um, I'm going to suggest, along with commonly fudged vital signs, um, people can very often, uh, and, and again, I'm equally guilty of this, most, most healthcare professionals that I know are guilty of this at some point or another, um, uh, of talking about LOCs and GCSs by just referring to the sum total of, of the GCS scores. Ah, he's about a GCS of 12. He's about a GCS of 15. I'm going to suggest that the only two GCSs that are acceptable to refer to as a sum total are gonna to be a three and a 15. If there's a three, there's only one GCS that adds up to three, that's one, one, one. And if there are 15, there's only one way you got to a 15, it's a four, five, six. Um, for everything else, the distribution and the balance of, of those numbers, so is the patient closing their eyes and opening them to verbal stimuli, making them a three, or is the patient acutely confused, making them a uh, uh, making them a four, four, six, for example, right? The balance and distribution of those GCS points uh, is, is pretty important, and I'm going to encourage folks that it's uh, it's best practice to uh, to include those numbers in your handoffs um, and in your awareness of what's going on with your patient, and your differential diagnosis. And etc. There's a whole bunch of uh, unusual or unexpected things that we want to be aware of in vital signs. Um, you know, fevers, hyperthermia, hypothermia, all this sort of thing. Um, uh, you know, as you're going. Secondary series after your vital signs, and possibly while you're doing your vital signs, we're going to talk about that in a sec. Um, I see some person, one person direct messaging me. Um, 
If you direct message me, unfortunately, guys, that doesn't get saved in the chat log. So I'll ask you to resend that publicly or if you're not comfortable with that, to email me uh, directly, nhume, N-H-U-M-E, at sjavicbc.ca. Um, unfortunately, I, I just, uh, the chat logs aren't saved and we go off the chat logs to submit this stuff, uh, um, to submit this stuff later on. Um, so after, uh, after vital signs, head to toe, um, your head to toe, and we're going to include tonight, we're going to talk about functional inquiries as well. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with functional inquiries, they're a, uh, um, they're a way of, of trying to direct the type of evaluation you do. So you're not asking for cardiac history or full cardiac history on someone who's got a paper cut on their finger, um, as an example, right? Um, so a head to toe on a functional inquiry is a focused approach to history taking. We're going to try and start with systems relevant to the patient's chief complaints. So for people who have uh, for people who have chest pain, we're going to start with taking a bit of a cardiac history. For people that are having respiratory difficulties, we're going to start taking a pulmonary history. Um, for people who are bleeding, we're going to find out if they take blood thinners, and we're going to ask them about uh, their history of trauma and what they started, uh, what started their bleeding today, for example. Right, and we're going to go quite far down the uh, quite far down the rabbit hole on this, I think, uh, as we move forward. Um, physical exams. This is a this is something that I note a lot of folks new to first aid and a lot of folks new to pre-hospital care um, struggle with a little bit because we we teach people to do in the classroom, we teach people to do these really, really detailed and really, really thorough physical head to toes. And the end result of that is that some poor guy comes into the first aid tent with a, a paper cut on his finger or a sprained wrist. And, you know, 10 minutes later, someone's palpating their ankles to, to, as part of their head to toe to ensure there's no other injuries uh, to, to their legs or something. This guy's saying, look, I just, I just I have a paper cut. I just need a Band-Aid. I just need someone to clean this and give me a Band-Aid. Um, physical exams should be appropriately focused. And what that means is we're going to do um, directed or focused uh, head to toe and in functional inquiries, right? So if someone's had, uh, someone's having chest pain, are we going to go down, um, you know, an entire route about uh, if they're having what seems like ischemic chest pain, are we going to go down a whole route asking about their asthma history? Well, no, not unless we get an indication that there's a respiratory component to their disease process today, right? Um, if you do have a time and opportunity, so once we've done some basic head to toe and functional inquiry stuff, um, do feel free to expand to other medical history as well. We'll talk a little bit about where that fits in later, but the, the short version is that once you've done all of your basic stuff and once you're sort of doing ongoing care, feel free to flesh out the remainder of, of, of your patient's history a little bit, right? Sometimes you get some extra little gems in there that can help you figure out uh, what's going on. Um, do try to understand what is going on with your patient and follow leads as they become apparent. So um, don't just look at your patient and say, oh, he's got chest pain. I'm just going to call this chest pain. Um, try to establish is the chest pain from uh, a cardiac event? Is there a cardiac history suggestive of a cardiac event? Or uh, is this person, you know, uh, have they suffered a traumatic injury? Do they have an infectious process that's leading to their chest pain? And so on and so forth, right? Um, do try to ask, and this goes back to the focused and functional component that I was, was talking about earlier. Do try to ask questions that will get useful and relevant information um, uh, and downstream for both yourself and for downstream care providers uh, like paramedics and ER staff. So, um, you know, it's very easy to do the most thorough and detailed, and I'm putting, if you guys can't see, I'm putting big air quotes up here, the most thorough and detailed uh, examination ever. And uh, if um, that's not necessarily helpful, if you've only got five minutes and you're still asking questions about, uh, you know, someone's uh, left toe or left foot big toe gout, uh, and you haven't got around to asking them about their, their ongoing chest pain and their previous cardiac history, and they're currently having more chest pain or cardiac chest pain today, right? So we want to start with the most useful and relevant information in terms of what's going to guide our care uh, and, and guide our clinical course and direction over the next, uh, you know, uh, 15, 20, 30, however long we're with this person, minutes. And also what's going to provide useful information to, uh, to paramedics and ER staff. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, uh, about what that information, I'm going to give you guys a whole bunch of, of some of my favorite clinical questions 
um, for different presentations and stuff as we move forward. Um, and finally, please use language appropriate for your patient. Um, this is something else I see a lot of uh, uh, that, that is kind of a pet peeve of mine is that people will, uh, um, people, uh, frontline care providers, and this is a little bit endemic uh, in, in sort of like mid-level care qualifications, if you will, um, but people will often use very technical language with patients who realistically might not know what that technical, like what, what acknowledging that uh, technical language might look like, right? So, um, you know, what is your chief complaint? Well, unless you've actually been a clinical practitioner for a period of time or done a whole bunch of first aid, most people have no idea what a chief complaint is, right? That, that's not a thing that a normal average untrained civilian on the street has any idea about the specific clinical or, or technical meaning of. Um, you know, say, what's troubling you the most right now? Hi, Martin. What's bothering you the very most right now? Why are you here and what can I do for you? Um, right? Uh, so just try to keep that in mind. It's, it's a pretty important one and it's going to really change the, uh, the quality of information you get out of your patient in terms of what you're getting for answers from them. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a term in, uh, in software programming and, and electronic engineering, garbage in, garbage out. And the idea is that if you, if you have a computer algorithm and you spit bad data into it, you're only going to get bad data and results out. Um, and the same thing goes here. If you're using technical language that your patient doesn't understand, you're not going to get the answers to the questions that you need, and your job is to, to be able to take care of them. Um, uh, I see a note here from Kyra saying it's especially important for people whose first language is in English. Even if they're normally functionally bilingual, it's easy to revert when you're panicking or in pain. Absolutely, 100%. Um, but I'm also going to suggest also for, you know, for, for many, many groups, not just, not just folks who, who have English as a second language, um, but also for folks uh, who are, you know, maybe elderly and, and like just not quite cognitively as swift as they were previously. This also applies to people like you, you meet a wide range of people um, whose background and education and, and cognitive capacity you might not know. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, uh, this, is, this is valid for everyone, right? Use language appropriate for your patient. In the same way, we sometimes use uh, kids speak when we're taking uh, taking care of young children. Um, you know, use just use common English terms when you're talking to your patient. Doesn't mean you have to. You know, it doesn't mean you can't use technical language when you're talking with other professionals. But you should be able to. Uh, you should be able to switch back and forth uh, between them and use appropriate language for an appropriate patient. So, a few general tips. Um, just as we move forward, and then I'm going to dive into some good questioning for uh, for all manner of different complaints. When you're trying to get your chief complaint, as I said, what is your chief complaint? Oh, well, chief complaint doesn't mean anything to anyone except us EMS nerds. Everyone who's here, there's 46 of us here tonight, guys. All of you are giving up a couple hours of your Monday night. You're all EMS nerds. I'm really sorry. Um, so what's, and I mean that with, with as a compliment, because I'm, I'm very much one as well, right? Um, what one thing is troubling you the most right now, or what thing is troubling you the most right now? Emphasis on the most, especially for folks who have multiple complaints, right? Um, for folks who are maybe struggling, where does it hurt right now? Well, it kind of hurts, and I, I, you know, I'm not sure if my video is um, superimposed over this or not, but you know, it hurts all over here in my chest and my abdomen and my leg and my pinky finger and right. Use one finger and point to where the pain is. Or if they say, oh, it's over a whole area, use one finger and draw a circle around where the pain is. And this will really help you focus in on people. Uh, like, you know, you'll find a lot of folks who struggle as an example. Um, I see this a lot with folks who have chronic arthritis pain and you ask them what hurt right, hurts right now. And they're here, they're, they're seeing you because of their chest pain. And then they start talking about their knee pain and their elbow pain and their shoulder pain and their hip pain. So, okay, use a finger and draw a circle around where the pain is right now. And the word the can really help focus things uh, quite a bit. Um, what changed to cause you to ask for help right now, right? So especially for folks who have what we call acute on chronic pain or acute on chronic complaints, I'm always short of breath, but it's much worse now, right? What changed to cause you to ask for help right now? Why are we dealing with this now instead of earlier today, yesterday, or later on, right? Very, very helpful question. Uh, you know, it, it, you have to be careful how you phrase this because it can come across as a little bit accusatory. 
um, if you're not careful, uh, you don't want to give someone the impression that you're bothered that they're, they've come to you to ask for help. So I sometimes preface this with, hey, help me understand. Help me understand what's going on. You've had this pain for two days. Why are you asking for help about it right now? What changed, right? Um, another thing, this is just a general tip. Get biographical information early. So your name, your date of birth, and your PHN. And by your, I mean your patients. Um, if you can get this stuff out of the way and get it jotted down onto your paperwork early in the game, it's just one less thing to think about later. Um, very often, I'll just ask for my patient's wallet or ask if their wallet is in their purse, hand their purse or their wallet to my partner, and then I keep going with my patient while my partner goes through, finds their stuff. Is your ID card in here? Yeah. Can I give this to my partner to find your ID card? Yeah. Great. Let's talk about your chest pain now. Right. It takes all of five seconds. Um, and it's a very, very important piece of the puzzle that can actually, if you, if you, if, if a patient manages to get all the way to the emergency department without someone getting this, it can really, really hang things up quite a bit um, while we try to establish a name and date of birth and all that, right? And the paramedic crews that are coming to take your patient off you will love you if you have all that stuff ready. Um, for those of us in British Columbia, we actually have on the ambulance, we have uh, um, uh, we actually have scanners for the BC ID cards. So if you have the patient's card that you've gotten out, don't put it back in the wallet and put it away. Keep it with the wallet or the purse or keep it out with the PCR. Um, it just makes things a lot faster for us when we're coming to pick someone up. So, um, Your partner can assess vitals, do paperwork, perform minor wound care and other tasks while you're talking to the patient. So we, we talk about this, you know, this flow of the secondary survey and we talk about providing ongoing care and minor wound care and all these things, right? It's important to remember that, you know, that sequencing of stuff is really important in a classroom environment because it lets us uh, assess exactly how you're doing and what your knowledge of each of these things is. But in the real world, there's two, three, four, five of you. There's no reason if you have sufficient personnel and resources that you can't have yourself talking to your patient to get history, your partner putting on a couple of band-aids and cleaning up some wounds, a third person writing stuff down in the clipboard, and a fourth person being the clean person to go in and out of the jump kit um, uh, without getting things bloody or contaminated, right? Those are absolutely reasonable uses of resources until such time as you don't have enough people and then another patient walks in and two of you have to go over and deal with the other patient or whatever, right? Um, I think, uh, oh, helpful questions asked. So um, I'm just going to go through, guys, for the next uh, however long this takes here. Uh, I've got half a dozen, uh, half a dozen slides or a dozen slides on helpful questions asked for different types of history taking, right? And we've all we've all gone through our MFR program stuff or our standard first aid stuff or whatever, um, and we've all sort of got our own archetype of how we proceed with questions for different chief complaints. Uh, the stuff I'm going to talk about here is not by any means comprehensive. This is not, and I have to be so clear about this, this is 100% not all of the things you need to ask for cardiac history. This is a list of questions and, and uh, a methodology that I find helpful for asking questions of people with what I think might, have, might be a cardiac complaint or might be a respiratory or psychiatric complaint or whatever. Right, so for cardiac history, you've got someone who has a complaint that you suspect might be cardiac in nature. They've come in with nebulous chest pain, um, or they've come in a little bit short of breath and a little bit gray. What questions do you wanna ask them, right? Well, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna get a clear history of your current complaint, your chief complaint, and do a low TARP or an OPQRST or whatever mnemonic you're using to assess that symptom set, right? Um, but you want to find out really clearly, you know, where is your discomfort? When did it start? Has it been there the whole time? Does it come and go? Does anything make it better? Does anything make it worse? What were you doing when it started? And on a scale of zero to 10, zero being no pain and 10 being the worst pain you've ever felt in your life, how bad is it? It's an eight. Okay. Is it tight? Yes. Is it squeezing? Um, it should, I should throw in as well it, it, with, um, as I say, is it tight? Um, do try to avoid leading questions, right? Like, um, you know, if you have to ask a leading question, don't say, 
do you have chest pain or do you have chest tightness? Because people might just say yes, right? Ask them, if, you know, first off say, you know, what does the sensation in your chest feel like? And if they say, oh, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. You know, you get someone who's maybe being a, bit, a little bit evasive or a vague or nebulous historian is the medical term. I prefer the term vague historian. Um, sometimes, sometimes you have to find a way to try and ask some leading questions without leading someone. And uh, one way to do that is to, to give someone sort of a menu of options, right? So you've got this feeling in your chest. Is it pain, discomfort, tightness, squeezing? What is it, right? Um, and, you know, hopefully they'll understand by some of the qualifying language that you're using what you're trying to under or what you're trying to ask them and, uh, and can maybe uh, provide some more information that's a bit more helpful. Um, does your patient have previous cardiac issues? Um, have they had previous heart surgery? Have they ever had angiograms done? Have they ever had stents placed? How many stents? When were they? When was their last heart, uh, when was their last heart surgery? When was their last angiogram? When was their last stent, right? Have they had previous heart attacks? How many and when? Um, I, I should have highlighted this. It's a high value question. Did your previous heart attack feel like this? Or does your current feeling feel like your previous heart attack? And if the answer is yes, that should be a big honk and red flag for you right off the bat. People who have had cardiac events before know what it feels like. They, they recognize that this is probably a cardiac event again. Um, and that can be a really, really big, helpful, uh, helpful question for you. So high value, easy to ask. And it's, it's very helpful too, because it's normally a fairly binary answer. It's normally, yes, it felt like this, or no, this feels different, right? And just to be clear as well, just because it doesn't feel like a previous heart attack, doesn't mean that it's not a heart attack today or a cardiac event today. Um, but uh, but if, it, if they identify that it feels similar to a previous cardiac event, great reason to go to hospital with uh, hopefully an advanced life support ambulance or someone to come and do an ECG at the very least, right? Um, do you have angina? Does it feel like this or is it different? Right? Do you take any heart medication? So one of the challenges you'll find with people is, do you have any medical problems? No. Do you take any medications? Yes, I take 14 different medications. I take bisoprolol and hydrochlorothiazide and ramipril and uh, aspirin. And okay, well, why do you take those medications? Oh, it's because I had a heart attack before, but I don't have a heart attack right now. Well, right. Um, so medication lists can give you a really helpful nudge in the right direction of things to ask about, right? People are notorious, notorious. And this maybe goes back to language as well. Um, if, if you ask, do you have any medical problems? And the person says, no, your very next question should be, do you take any medicine or medication for any reason? And I don't quite understand this. Maybe uh, um, I'll, I'll resist throwing a shot at some of the older folks in the group here. Um, but I, uh, I don't, I genuinely don't understand this myself. Some people, don't seem to understand the question, do you take any medications? And we'll say no, but I take medicine. And I don't understand the difference between those, but I do intentionally now phrase my questioning and say, do you take any medications or medicines? Um, because in some people's world, they're different, uh, they're different answers. Um, specifically, if someone's uh, got a cardiac history, do they take any blood thinners? Do they take any nitroglycerin, right? Do they have a prescription for nitroglycerin? If they have a prescription for nitroglycerin, how often do you use it? Do you use it every day? Do you find you use it every week? Did you use it today and it doesn't do what it normally did? Right. All these things are uh, all these things are helpful information. Do you take daily aspirin? Do you take aspirin at all? How much? And when was your last one? So if you're going down a cardiac chest pain pathway with someone, um, you know, es establishing if they take regular aspirin, how much they take every day or, or however infrequently they're taking it. And when their last one was can be really important in determining how much aspirin you're able to give them, right? Uh, certainly under St. John protocols at the very least. Um, and have you felt like this before? When and what was the diagnosis? So no, this doesn't feel like my previous chest pain. This feels like uh, five years ago, I cracked one of my ribs and had a, a, you know had some muscle or some chest wall muscle strain. And this feels just like that. Okay, great. That's helping me nudge things down, uh, nudge things down maybe away from a cardiac pathway and towards uh, a musculoskeletal pathway, an orthopedic pathway, right? Um, 
respiratory history. So folks that come in short, short of breath, what are some good questions that we can ask folks who are feeling short of breath, come in gasping for breath, come in, come in a little bit hypoxic, we're called to them because they're having trouble breathing, right? So right off the bat, um, do you have any previous lung problems? Are you asthmatic? Do you have COPD? Have you had pulmonary embolisms or other types of blood clots? Um, do you have any other problems with your lungs, right? Um, lung problems are very, folks who have lung problems, I think it'd be fair to say are often a bit more knowledgeable about them than folks with other medical problems because lung problems are very, very troubling to people. They're very uncomfortable to experience or, or lung conditions are very uncomfortable to experience. And most people who have, who have been bothered by lung problems more often than other problems will have sought medical care and possibly received a diagnosis for their, their pulmonary issue, right? Um, if they have previous pulmonary issues, try to find out what they're called. Um, most asthmatics know they're asthmatic. People who've had pulmonary embolisms normally, if they were serious enough to, to land them in medical care, will normally know that they had a pulmonary embolism, or they might just say a blood clot in my lung, right? Um, people who are prone to blood clots elsewhere, like, oh, I've never had a pulmonary embolism, but I've had DVTs three times. Right, okay, well. Now we, we, you know, we can at least add that to our differential or to our, to our jigsaw puzzle, right? Um, I should say, uh, do you have any prescription puffers or inhalers? Um, so people with especially COPD and asthma, very common for them to have puffers or inhalers, MDIs, metered dose inhalers, the little puff puff. Um, I don't have one to show you guys right now, but uh, the little uh, puff puff blue asthma inhalers are very common. Um, if they do, how often do you use them? Do you use them every day? Do you use them once a week? Would you normally use one right now? And if you would, why aren't you? Why are you talking to me instead of using your inhaler? Oh, you forgot it at home. Okay, well, now we have something we can work with. Right now I have, you know, an asthmatic who doesn't have their inhaler with them and just needs some Bentolin, right? Um, or, or, you know, conversely, you have used your inhaler right now and it's not having any effect. Well, that, or it's not having the desired effect. Well, that suggests to me possibly a worse than typical um, asthmatic or COPD exacerbation, right? Um, have you felt like this before? When and what was the diagnosis? Again, this is uh, you know functionally the same question as we're asking potentially people with cardiac histories. Um, you know, you will sometimes run into people who are asthmatic and uh, also having an MI they're feeling short of breath because their cardiac function is decreased. Have you felt like this before? No, this is not my asthma. This is something different than my asthma. Well, that's a very important piece of information, right? It's very easy to focus on some of these big ticket items, um, you know, and, and, you know, just because someone is an asthmatic diabetic doesn't mean that their problem today is an asthma or a diabetes problem. It could be something else, right? Neurological history. So folks who show up with something that we uh, that we suspect might be neurological in nature. Um, and there's a whole bunch of things that can maybe be neurological in nature, right? Um, I sort of wrote this slide thinking largely about CVAs and TIAs, but this stuff applies to, uh, to seizures and, and you know, uh, general confusion and all this sort of stuff as well. Have you ever had a previous CVA or TIA? It's important, this is going back to using plain language. Have you ever had a stroke or a mini stroke, right? A lot of people have no idea what a TIA or a CVA is. A lot of people are terrible at remembering this stuff. Sometimes people are even discombobulated by the word neurological. And yes, I use discombobulated on purpose there. Um, but, but, you know, have you ever had a stroke? Have you ever had a heart attack? Have you ever had a mini stroke, right? We call TIAs mini strokes. Um, these can be different ways of phrasing the same thing. Sometimes you can use both terms. Have you ever had a stroke or a TIA or a mini stroke, right? You're, you're, you're using some redundant language, but you're helping try and make the sentence or the question accessible to people, right? And if, you, if, if your questioning isn't accessible to your patient, completely useless questioning, right? If yes, yes, I've had a stroke before. Wow, that sounds really difficult. I should have put this on the slide here, but when was your last stroke? How many have you had? 
And were there any persisting symptoms or sequelae? A lot of people will have permanent disability secondary to a stroke. And that permanent disability can be as, as simple as just a little bit of facial droop or a little bit of weakness in one hand. Um, all of these things can be, you know, um, can, can persist re really for the rest of someone's life after they've had uh, after they've had one stroke. And it's important to be able to distinguish when you're doing your later on your stroke assessment, are the symptoms that we're seeing today new or do they exist or have they existed previously, right? Um, do you have a previous history of blood clots or bleeds inside your brain, right? Um, again, you know, what we're trying to establish is do you have any coagulopathies? Are you prone to, and that includes DBTs, other clotting issues, right? Or have you had, uh, have you had a, a, any kind of bleed in your brain, any kind of um, hemorrhagic stroke? Don't use that language. Use have you had a, have you ever had blood clots or bleeds in your brain? Um, history of concussions. Uh, if you think the person's got a concussion today, sure. If you don't think they have a concussion today, probably not a super, uh, super relevant question, right? Uh, a, a history of concussions previously probably isn't going to be a huge issue. I mean, you might see some like some memory and focus and headache issues and stuff. Uh, I, I suppose, but in terms of acute presentations, I wouldn't expect that to, to, to manifest um, in a way that would be a stroke mimic, for example, or a seizure mimic. We'll talk about those in a bit. Um, so history of blood clots, and that includes, you know, someone says, oh, I've had blood clots in my leg before. Well, if you've had blood clots in your leg, maybe you've got a clotting issue and maybe that can get into your brain too, right? So just things to note, is it gonna change your clinical course or management? Probably not. Is it useful information for people downstream from you? Absolutely. Do you take any medications, right? Or medicines? Are any of them blood thinners? Oh, and, and some people will have no idea what the names of their medications are. They won't have a darn clue, um, but they will be able to tell you that they take a blood thinner or a, you know, or a water pill, which is a diuretic to help lower their blood pressure, for example, right? So, um, you know, and if, if someone can't provide the name of their medication, it is important to just write down what they say. Well, if they take, I don't take any medicines, I just take a, a water pill. A water pill is, you know, older generation speak for diuretic, which is often used for, for hypertension, right? Um, with a neuro history, do you have a headache? Do you have a sore or stiff neck? Right. What are we looking for there? We're looking for bleeds into cerebrospinal fluid or potential bleeds into cerebrospinal fluid. Right. Um, make sure if you're dealing with someone, I should have with this, I think I do actually have a separate slide for, for seizure-like stuff later on. I think I, I intended this slide to be more stroke-like stuff. I should have I should have labeled that a bit better. I'm sorry, guys. Um, but with anything that you're looking at as a stroke-like event, a clear history of the current event is critical. What do we mean by clear history? We want time and speed of onset and a last seen well time. These are absolutely critical um, for some of the very, very, very high end management that we can do uh, at a hospital with a patient who's had a stroke. Having a really, really solid time. Of when was the last time this person was seen well? When was, how fast did their symptoms come on can, can be, you know, arguably some of the most important information you can gather um, for, for an individual. Um, similarly, a, a, a really, really solid baseline Cincinnati stroke assessment, uh, fast van assessment is critical, right? What are they like when you meet them? As soon as you can, like right up there with vitals, um, establishing what a baseline is so we can determine what direction this person is trending in uh, is, is really, really important. Diabetic history, do you have, so you've got someone for whatever reason, you've, you've you know, an altered level of consciousness, uh, uh, um, you know, maybe a diabetic medic alert bracelet, or someone says, oh, I think they're diabetic. You're asking your diabetic questions. Questions that are important to ask, do you have diabetes? If yes, what kind? Is it type one, type two, or is it type two and you take insulin? Because some, insul some type two diabetics who have consistent high sugars do take insulin, right? How often do you check your sugar? When was the last time you checked it, right? And again, um, these are all questions that are very reasonable to ask uh, if, if someone's there with a friend or a spouse or a partner. Um, these are very reasonable questions to ask friend, spouse, partner as well. Um, th th I think it'd be fair to say that the majority of people's 
you know, romantically linked spouse, partner, people, whatever, um, are at least going to have a baseline idea of, of their partner's medical history, right? So uh, if you can't ask your patient yourself, which very often you can't with diabetics if they're unconscious, um, feel free to ask the person who's there with them if there is someone. Um, what's a normal sugar for you, right? Some people, specifically type twos, uh, some people wander about with a baseline sugar every single day of like 16. Um, that's a wildly high sugar for someone who is not diabetic. And it's probably not great for anyone to be wandering about with 16, but there's a bunch of, of reasons there, you know, hopefully their endocrinologist is on top of where someone might actually have a normal baseline sugar of, 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 of you know, 12, 15 or something like that. Um, and if they tell you that that's normal for them, uh, you should believe them and not get too alarmed about it. If they say my sugar is normally six and today it's 15, maybe we should look into this, right? When was your last meal? What was it? Um, with what was it? We're not necessarily looking for like a detailed, like five-star restaurant, like paragraph of what it was. We want to know, did the, you know, did you have a meal or a snack? Was it a bunch of protein and carbs? Uh, did you just eat three Mars bars and call it a day, right? Um, I had a meal, I had chicken and rice. It was at five o'clock, great. That's all the information you need there. Um, maybe a large meal or a small meal, but uh, you know, we, we, don't need, uh, we don't need the entire menu listing. Um, for people who are taking insulin, when was your last insulin? Did you, in, do you inject or do you have an insulin pump? Insulin misdosing is a very real thing. Um, insulin misdosing is probably responsible for a reasonable portion of the type one diabetic calls that I attend. Um, insulin misdosing is, I mean, most folks who are taking insulin are pretty good with it. Um, folks who are taking insulin and are maybe less detail oriented or folks who are taking insulin and uh, struggle with alcohol use uh, make up a reasonable uh, a reasonable portion of those. Um, a number of times I've gone to attend to people who have become uh, quite drunk and uh, taken their insulin while they've been drinking and simply done the math wrong. Um, so, you know, something else to think. Um, if someone has an insulin pump, for those of you who don't know, insulin pumps uh, normally clip onto a belt, uh, have a little sub-Q uh, uh, sub uh, uh, cannula, and actually will some of them, some of the super fancy ones will either deliver insulin at a specified rate or measure insulin, deliver insulin in response to the measurement. Um, if someone is hypoglycemic, one of the first things you should do is see if you can turn off their insulin pump. Uh, it's very rare for them to actually malfunction, but the last thing, if it's doing some sort of constant feed or, or something like that, we don't want that. And frankly, it's unlikely, uh, unless you happen to be a type one diabetic with a pump yourself, it's unlikely that you're gonna be able to be familiar enough with the device to rule it out as a source of potential um, cause of the hypoglycemia. So um, rule out the possible cause, turn it off, disable it, whatever you need to do. Um, have you been exerting yourself for exercising today? Um, uh, another fairly common thing that I seem to get called for with, uh, um, with type one or insulin dependent diabetics is they were exercising today and they took more insulin than they needed to. Um, or they, uh, uh, they, they misdose their insulin based on their exertion and exercise levels, right? Um, a little bit less common in St. John World, but we still do these at, at large crowd events. We do a lot of elderly weakness and collapse, right? So old person collapse. They didn't necessarily fall over and, and hit their head or anything like that. They just became weak and kind of slumped to the ground. So the things we want to ask for these folks, did you lose consciousness at any time? Have you been feeling unwell lately? What's been troubling you and for how long, right? I should, pardon, before I go too far here, uh, did you lose consciousness at any time? We're trying to establish if they had a syncopal event, did they faint? Did they become unconscious for a period of time, which might suggest a cardiac or a neurological problem? Or have they just been feeling weak and just kind of finally reached the end of their rope? Have they been feeling unwell lately? Uh, what's been troubling you and for how long? Um, oh yes, I've been feeling worse and worse and worse for several days, but today is my husband Harold's birthday and I really wanted to take him to the sandwich fair, so I decided to tough it out anyway, right? Well, maybe you've had an infection running for a few days and you finally just overexerted yourself today, possibly, right? Or I've been having this pesky chest pain and shortness of breath. It's been getting worse for a couple of days and now it's just 
too much for me. Oh, well, we better start asking some quick, uh, some cardiac questions, right? Um, I see Dave saying, can I add into pumps for a second? Yes, David, please turn your video and mic on and add in for, for insulin pumps if you'd like, bud. Hi, everyone. Sorry, if you missed the talk, uh, it's a slight mild subject matter expert in and around diabetes and insulin pumps because I have diabetes. Um, what Nick said is largely accurate. Um, just a couple things to add on. There are extremely few reported the confirmed cases of an insulin pump actually malfunctioning and going crazy and delivering so much insulin that it causes somebody to go down. There's been one pump ever that's been confirmed to have repeatedly done that. And almost every case that's initially reported as an insulin pump malfunction ends up being human error on one end or the other there. Um, so when you're dealing with somebody's pump, I would be very cautious about going in and pressing random buttons and trying to turn it off. Um, there's just as good a chance that you'll end up delivering insulin otherwise. So if you have a family member there or somebody that knows how to turn it off, great. Um, I would never ever try to physically remove the pump from somebody. Um, so don't, don't try to unplug it a connector if it has there, especially don't try to remove it from the person um, that it's attached to at the site there. Because um, most of the time when those pumps are delivering insulin, unless it's in the middle of a big delivery that is a human error issue, it's delivering such a relatively low amount of insulin per hour uh, that it's very easy to combat that with um, introduced medication like oral or um, IV antihypoglycemics like uh, glucose. Um, so pumps, if you can suspend them easily, great, but I wouldn't be too, too concerned about it. It's interesting because I've, I've had two in my career, I've had two patients who have, after we've woken them up, self-attributed misconfiguration of their insulin pumps to the to being the proximal cause for their event today. But I don't know enough about the insulin pumps to, to know if that's likely or if that's someone misunderstanding what happened. I've had two people, oh, I set the stupid thing up wrong. Um, yeah, so, so be, sorry, if we're going too much down a sidetrack, let me know. No, no, that's the fine. The very short version is the less smart insulin pumps are programmed with what's called an insulin to carb ratio. So it knows that for 15 grams of carbs that you consume, you need, you need one unit of insulin. And there's a few other numbers in there, but essentially what you do is you tell it your current blood sugar, and then you tell it how many grams of carbs you ate. And then it calculates how much insulin to give you for those carbs. And if your current blood sugar is too high or too low, it'll alter that to make a correction to get you to your goal blood sugar. Interesting. Um, the new smarter pumps are connected to the continuous glucose monitors. So it is constantly doing the small correction dosing. So if it starts to see your blood sugar trending down, it'll dial back the amount of insulin it's giving as that background basal a little bit to let your sugars catch back up there. And same, if you're going too high, it'll automatically increase the amount of basal dosing to try and trend you back down that way. And then it still does the background of um, dose setting. Um, but just for example, like I, for a bowl of Doritos, just took three units of insulin for 75 grams of Doritos. Um, if I took three units of insulin without eating the Doritos, I'd be pretty loopy and quite low right now. And my basal dosing is about 0.7 units per hour. Um, a large meal, like a Wendy's Baconator with fries and a um, like a large Diet Coke is six or seven units for me. Sushi is like eight or nine units because there's so many carbs that way. So the, the amount of dosing that it's actually giving over an hour, like even in the 10 minutes that you're dumping, it takes to dump a 500 milliliter bag of um, D5 saline intravenously, or the, even the 20 minutes it takes to um, get like a thing of um, glucogel from your stomach and actually processed. Yeah. Like a tube of glucogel is about 20 grams of carbs. So I would need, yeah. I would need about a unit of insulin to offset that. And a pump or just background basal insulin is only delivering, in my case, maybe maybe 0 0.2 of a unit in that time. Right. Um, even people who are on high basal dosing, it's it's not delivering a huge amount. So the only thing would be is if someone was administering a large amount of bolus insulin and they were, it, it, it would be very unlikely that the pump's doing that. And so, like you were saying earlier, misconfiguration of pumps. So people who are still dialing in their pump settings um, or still figuring out their insulin to carb ratios 
or people who miscount the carbs in their meal or people who misenter things like all human factor sides of things yeah can like, be a reason for pumps to do it but by I've the time certainly, i've certainly seen at least one where someone and and this is equally likely with um someone who's self-administering their insulin versus using a pump um i took my insulin and then i got distracted and didn't eat my meal is probably yes. the most common the most common i took my thing. insulin and then i was just not as hungry as i thought it was yeah um but yeah so the, the human human factors are part of it but even then by the time that we get involved in one of those calls that pump has almost certainly delivered all of the bolus insulin that's going to be involved and so we're back to that very low background basal yeah. dosing but versus like a true like the pump just deciding you know what screw this i'm giving you all the insulin i have left now like a true runaway pump is extremely uncommon yeah uh, well as we would hope right like that would mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like I like g genuinely the, the FDA has I think two like, fully confirmed cases of it and I'm sure that there's a few more out there where the pump itself hasn't made it all the way to the FDA for investigation um yeah. but they've 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 attributed two deaths ever to that that they've confirmed that way um mm -hmm. and just going back going to Kyra's question there um it's a very small cannula and it basically it gets launched in by a needle and then the needle pulls out and leaves a cannula in the subcutaneous fat layer. So under the skin, but above the muscle. Um, so it's designed that the pump just slowly infuses the insulin into the subcutaneous fat, and then it infuses from the subcutaneous fat into the body that way. Um, so people with an insulin pump have that site attached to them and it just stays there for two to three days before it gets changed out. Sorry for that wild tangent. Along no, no, that's okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that's honestly really good information. I'm going to keep moving because this is a bit of a longer presentation. So I'm going to keep, uh, I'm going to keep trucking along. Um, but thank you for that. I, I really genuinely value your input on these things. So, um, so going back to weakness and collapse history, uh, have you been feeling unwell lately? What's been troubling you for how long? Um, do you have any chest pain or discomfort? Anytime someone's got a, uh, got a generalized weakness, it's not a bad idea to ask. Do you have any chest pain or discomfort? Oh well, yes, I have this like little bit of a tightness in my chest. Really, tell me about that, right? Do you have any shortness of breath or changes in your breathing? Yeah, I feel like I'm just not quite getting a full breath in properly. I'm just, I'm just, I feel a little bit like I just can't breathe that well. It's been going on for about an hour now, right? Again, things that might nudge you down a, a cardiac pathway a little bit. Have you been prescribed antibiotics for any reason in the past 12 months? What are we looking for here? Um, we're looking for any previous infections that might have remanifested themselves, right? UTIs in the elderly, urinary tract infections in the elderly are, are notorious for this. Um, you know, little old, uh, little old Mrs. Smith, who's 85 years old, she had a UTI, she got treated with antibiotics, she thought it was all gone. And then three months later, it comes back with a vengeance. Um, except this time it comes back in the upper urinary tract instead of the lower urinary tract. And she doesn't get all those UTI-like symptoms. She just gets a kidney infection instead. And then the kidney infection turns into a metabolic disorder. And then she collapses at the sandwich fair. Um, this is a relatively common event. Um, you know, certainly not every collapse or anything like that, but it's a reasonable thing to ask about, right? Um, what, what did you take antibiotics for? When did you take all of them, right? Standard antibiotic questions. Um, have you noticed any recent changes in your bathroom habits, either urination or bowel movements? Uh, we're going for the same thing here. We're going for any history of recent UTIs or, or, uh, or, or um, gastric uh, infections at all. Um, you know, are these questions that I would ask a 20, uh, maybe even, yeah, actually someone in their 20s or 30s, um, UTIs uh, and other infections can be insidious, so sure, it's not an unreasonable question to throw at anyone, really, um, when they've had a, a weakness or a collapse event. Um, seizure history. I should put this beside the neuro slides. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't, guys. Uh, I, I'm probably not going to fix that for the video presentation. But um, So someone's had a seizure. You've been called. What do you want to know? You want to know how long was today's seizure? Was it tonic, clonic, shaking? Was it an absent seizure where they're staring vacantly into space and not responding? Was it focal? Was there just part of them shaking? Um, was anything different today about today's seizure compared to previous seizures, right? Was there anything unusual about this that's different than your normal seizures? If you have a normal seizure disorder, and I probably put these points uh, out of order here as well, um, 
Was there one seizure or several? How many and how long was each? So did you have one big long seizure lasting a minute? Did you have five minute long seizures? That's a, that's a different thing entirely, um, right? Do you have a diagnosed seizure disorder? I should have put this up top there, guys, and I'm sorry I didn't have that slide sequenced right. Um, but do you have a diagnosed seizure disorder? People who have epilepsy know they have epilepsy normally. Um, and uh, their friends and family are very likely going to be able to tell you, or, or possibly even the patient themselves, depending on how fast they recover, are very likely going to be able to tell you if this is normal for them, if this is abnormal for them, um, and so forth. People who have had first-time seizures, um, first-time seizures are big honking red flags for, frankly, a lot of really big scary things and not, not very many good things cause seizures. Um, if someone's had a first time seizure, they 100% need to go to a hospital and be seen by a physician. So um, do you take medications for your seizure disorder if you have a diagnosed seizure disorder? Um, have you been drinking alcohol in the past day or two? The, the main reason for this is not because we think alcohol causes seizures directly, but um, um, alcohol does inhibit the action of, uh, of some seizure medications. We're not gonna go down that rabbit hole too deeply, but someone who's on regular daily seizure medications and has a few beers effectively can wipe out their, their seizure medications capacity to, to function as an anticonvulsant. And so they can be prone to seizures all of a sudden. So it can be a, a good question. Um, environmental and exposure stuff. So hyperthermia, hypothermia. Uh, someone comes into you, they've been found out in the cold, they've been out there for Lord knows how long, they have a decreased level of consciousness, or you have a heat exposure, someone's been found lying out in the sun at the sandwich fair, um, you know, hot, dry, they're not sweating anymore, they're dragged into the first aid tent. How long was their duration of exposure, right? How long were they out in the heat or the cold that they were exposed to? Um, what is the temperature environmental conditions that they were exposed to? Were they out in 25 degree heat, 35 degree heat, 45 degree heat, right? Um, it's very, very hot. Similarly, were they out in five degree rain or were they out in minus five degree snow or minus 20 degree snow or, or whatever? Um, if you're able to actually put notes uh, in, your, uh, in your history taking, put notes about what the actual temperature and weather conditions were like for exposure stuff. Don't just say hot sun because hot sun means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? I think it's hot when it's hotter than about 15 or 20 degrees. I'm like, I get uncomfortable at about 20, right? Um, you know, other people think 40 degrees is absolutely fantastic and lovely, right? So try and be like out in sun, bracket 40 degrees, sunny, no shade, or in the rain, five degrees, right? Um, how, when, and where was the patient found? Who found them? Were they noticed missing? after they didn't return home after a hike? Uh, were, they, uh, were they stumbled across by bystanders? How, how did they get found, right? This again can help lead you to a better understanding of how long they were exposed, what they were exposed to. Um, what were they wearing when they were found? Were they wet or dry? Has anyone removed any of their clothing before they come to you, right? Have they been conscious since being found? Have they you know, been conscious and then lost consciousness? Have they been unconscious and regained consciousness? Try and establish that. Um, was anyone else with them and are there any other patients, right? Um, is this you know, one member of a hiking group and the rest of the group is missing? Uh, is it just one person and so on and so forth? One of the most common things that St. John Ambulance deals with and a lot of pre-hospital healthcare professionals deal with is wound care. So what questions do we want to ask with, uh, with wounds and when we're providing wound care to someone? We want to know what the wound is from. Did you get bit by a dog, cut by a knife, cut by a piece of paper, um, drag your hand across a piece of barbed wire at the sandwich fair? Um, what, is your wound, uh, what is your wound from? If your wound was from a fall or if your patient's wound was from a fall, make sure you take a fall history as well. It comes up in a moment here. Uh, yeah. Um, but, you know, make sure you ask your fall history questions as well. Um, was there bleeding? Was it resolved before, uh, before first aid or pre-hospital care got there? Did the bleeding require direct pressure? Did it need multiple ABD pads or gauze? Did it need a tourniquet to stop, right? All these things are pretty important questions, right? And also pretty important things to note in your history. 
Um, if you're bandaging the wound, make sure you record the details and uh, of the size and nature of the wound. Um, when someone goes to higher level of care or to a higher level of care, one of the first things that higher level of care is, is going to want to know about is the nature of the wound, um, you know, how big it is, how badly was it bleeding, and so on and so forth. Um, and if they can't tell, if it's not documented effectively, the first thing they're going to want to do is rip off the bandage or dressing that you put on there and have a look at it themselves. Um, something uh, at my workplace that I'm lucky enough to be able to do is uh, I'm able to uh, I'm able to use my laptop, my patient care record laptop, to actually take a photo of the wound and be able to show it to staff at the hospital. Um, you don't have that luxury, or most of you won't have that luxury. What you can do is, is consider talking to the patient and saying, can I use your phone to take a photo of this so you can show the doctor later? Yes, great, fantastic. And then you can take a photo of it and, and send that off to the hospital with them, right? It's, a, it's an option. So in some cases, it might not be appropriate, but uh, in other cases, it might be. So you know, you have to play that one a bit by ear. Um, when was your patient's last tetanus booster shot? Most people don't know. Um, apparently mine was a year and a half ago and I don't even remember it. So, uh, you know, I had to look it up myself when I was writing this slide earlier today. Uh, does the wound need further cleaning? It, if it does, if it looks like it's grossly dirty, contaminated, uh, and in need of what we would call debridement, debridement is just a medical term for getting the crud out of it, uh, document that. Document wound is dirty, has you know X, Y, Z in it, contaminated with whatever it's contaminated with. Make sure that's documented clearly that it's going to need cleaning. Uh, you might want to consider leaving a, a heavily, heavily contaminated wound open to the air for a period of time to try and help some of the contaminants get out from it, or depending on what the contaminants are, depending on if there's bleeding and so on and so forth, right? Uh, does the wound look like it might need sutures or closures? This is helpful information um, to, uh, to, to pass on to folks. Again, um, you know, if, if the wound is minor in nature and you're just putting a little bit of telfa onto it, yeah, no problem. If, uh, if the wound looks like it's significant, it's gonna need 10, 15, 20 sutures or whatever, um, it's helpful for hospital staff to have an awareness of that when this person walks in the door at the hospital later on. Fall history. So questions and uh, things you want to record. Why did you fall? What events led up to your patient falling? Uh, was their fall mechanical? Did they just trip? Is it syncopal? Did they lose consciousness or was there another cause? How far was the fall? Did they fall from standing? Did they fall down the stairs? Okay. Uh, what did you land on? Did they land on concrete? Did they land on a soft bed of moss? Did they land on a feather down comforter um, or pillow or whatever, you know, or bed or whatever? Um, these are all very different sort of fall events. It's important to know which one there is. Did they hit anything on the way down? I, I recently cared for someone who uh, um, had a fall on their, uh, they actually had no injuries from hitting the ground. All of their injuries were from the objects that they hit on the way down to the ground. Do list all the injuries you find, even the small ones, um, in your documentation. This can be really helpful for someone trying to establish, um, you know, patterns of injuries or understanding someone who's reading your documentation later to understand the extent of the injuries, right? So make sure you have like, you know, abrasions to left elbow, left knee, left ankle. Oh, it sounds like they fell and hit their left side, right? How long was the patient on the ground for? Uh, folks who fall, and uh, we're unlikely to see this in our in, in the St. John pre-hospital world, but in, in other pre-hospital worlds, uh, it's more common. Um, folks who have been on the ground for, you know, one, two, four, six, 10, 12, 20 more hours. Um, you know, uh, the person who fell is often not in the best place uh, to evaluate how long they were down for, but other people might be able to provide that information for you. Um, have you fallen recently? Have you, uh, have you fallen, uh, you know, a couple of times this month, but not before then, right? Is this a common event? Is this an uncommon event? Has something changed in the last month to make you fall more frequently? Uh, were there witnesses to the fall? Um, if yes, verify the story with them. So a lot of times people, oh, no, I didn't lose consciousness when I fell. And then you go and ask the five people that saw it happen. So, oh, yeah, they were out for like two minutes when they hit the ground. Different story, right? Um, opiate overdose history. Um, I think we all have, have done a reasonable number of, uh, or a lot of us have done a reasonable number of opiate overdoses now. Um, things that are important, we, we should recognize very frequently, uh, these folks are, are up and moving and, and uh, 
um, sometimes before we get there and stuff, if you're able to talk with someone, establish a history, um, some useful questions, right? Were you using drugs? Yes or no? If they say no, talk with them a little bit more. Uh, sometimes people don't recall that they were using drugs. Sometimes people don't want to admit they were using drugs. Sometimes they weren't using drugs and something else happened, right? And I, I care a lot less if they just don't remember or are maybe not able or not in a place where they want to talk to you about their drug use, but you want to make sure that you're not missing something else that's going on, right? Um, is there any alcohol on board, right? Um, if you were using drugs, were you smoking, injecting? Um, some knowledge of local street terminology might be helpful in this. Um, Nancy says edibles. Most of the stuff that causes overdoses doesn't come in edible form. I mean, I guess meth. I have seen people like have significant challenges after ingesting large quantities of meth. Um, and I suppose you could have people have, have opiate overdoses secondary to pill form. Um, uh, pretty unusual except when they're intentional like most opiate most edible opiates come in dosage dosing that would require you to have like a significant quantity of pills to overdose on them um did you intend to overdose or was this an accident um this can be an important question in well in quite a few cases actually right there are a reasonable number of people who, who try to end their own life with opiate overdoses and uh, um, I see your question, I'll get back to it in a second there. Um, people who suffer from opiate overdoses with the intent of ending their own life. Um, it's unfortunate, it's kind of horrible, uh, but it's important to establish if we're dealing with an accidental OD or a psychiatric emergency. Um, and, and Nancy's question, you think of cannabis cookies eaten without knowing what kind they were. Um, sure, again, so you know, we're, we're talking specifically uh, opiate overdose history for, for this particular slide, this particular section here. I, I didn't necessarily talk about other overdoses or other non-opiate overdoses. I don't think I have a slide on that later, sorry. Um, sure, if, if you've got someone uh, that, that you think has consumed a, a large quantity of, of, if they appear to be someone who might be impaired by a large quantity of marijuana, um, you know, trying to establish how they onboarded that would be a very reasonable thing. Um, I don't know what else to, I don't know what else to throw at you about that. It's unlike, it's unusual for people to have challenges with marijuana um, from smoking. Uh, it's certainly, in my experience, fairly common for people to have challenges requiring emergency intervention um, from edible marijuana. Um, in fact, I think I've never, I don't think I've ever cared for anyone or been asked to care for anyone who has just smoked too much. And I have many, 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 many times gone to emergency scenes where someone has eaten too much and is just unable to cope or is, is having a bad event. Um, did anyone see the overdose? Uh, so if someone's become unconscious secondary to street drug use, um, you know, did anyone witness this? Was this person found down or did someone see them go down? This goes to establishing how long they were down for before resuscitation attempts started, right? So um, depending on depending on what's going on, uh, this can be a very important question. If this turns into a cardiac arrest or if this is a cardiac arrest, um, did anyone see them go down or were they down when they were found is a really, really important question. Uh, did anyone give naloxone? And if yes, how much? right? Um, the majority of, of overdoses we see on the street these days have naloxone administered prior to anyone's arrival. That includes, um, you know, in the pre-COVID days when we were running a lot of our street clinics here in Victoria, um, you know, very often they'd have two Narcans into them before we managed to get out of the medic room and across the courtyard um, to the, or into the bathroom to the overdose event, right? Did anyone do CPR or rescue breathing and for how long? Um, this comes back to, was there an arrest, but also um, you know, if someone calls 911 for an overdose, um, and I'm sure David will, will verify this for us if, if we ask him to, um, if someone has, uh, if someone is experiencing an apneic or not breathing overdose event, um, our emergency dispatch services will direct uh, bystanders to perform compression only CPR because we're not doing rescue breathing and stuff during COVID. So that they might have rescue breathing, uh, uh, or pardon me, CPR instead of rescue breathing. 
some people who are a little bit uh, a little bit more old school, a little bit more experienced, might be doing rescue breathing as well, right? Some people uh, might have overdosed in a place where uh, where they have other services available. So someone might have actually been ventilating the bag valve mask as well. Find out what was being done before you got there, right? How long was it going on for? Um, once you've managed to to, to resuscitate someone, uh, hopefully that that you know is normally the the way things go with these events. Um, and you're trying to provide a little bit of ongoing care for them. Have they overdosed before? If the answer is, and, and it, this doesn't decrease the severity of the event if the answer is yes. But for folks who say, no, this is my first time ever overdosing, there's a possibility that this could be, and I mean, it could be for other folks as well, to, to be fair, um, you know, a sentinel event that might be able to, uh, might, might be um, a sentinel event that'll encourage them um, to, or push, put them into a place where they're able to uh, ask for or accept care. Sentinel event, uh, Kyra, is, uh, is, is uh, a term used to describe an event that's, um, it, it's sort of a red flag event, a warning event, right? So um, as an example, uh, someone who's uh, maybe struggling with their alcohol use and the first time they ever completely black out and don't remember a single thing for six hours could be a sentinel event. For them to work on getting their alcohol use uh, under control and getting help for that. Someone who's been a substance user for a while uh, has never overdosed and then has has uh, has an unconscious overdose event where they're resuscitated. Um, hypothetically, might be uh, a little bit alarmed by that and might be in a place where they're uh, more anxious or more interested in uh, being hooked up with additional services and care. Right. So, is this a sentinel event for someone? If yes. Uh, oh, I don't think I have, would they like help accessing uh, additional support services? Is there any other help I can give you today? And that could include uh, trying to help uh, help this person access, uh, you know, a social worker or someone to help them access detox or rehab or anything like that. Um, is, are those questions to ask only for someone who's having a first overdose event? Uh, nope. Uh, and no, the, the, the term sentinel event, I don't think, uh, I don't think necessarily folks would, would know that. Uh, that's why you're going to ask, do they want help accessing support services? Is there any, any other help I can give you today? Um, do you want help accessing detox? Um, and if they say yes, try and hook them up with social work, maybe nearby shelter spaces. Maybe 211 is a great service here in British Columbia. Um, maybe access to a social worker liaison nurse at a hospital. All of these things are, are, you know, or whatever other routes you have, but all these things are things that can maybe be helpful and meaningful to someone. Um, so this is a contentious question. I forgot I put this slide in until just now. This is a contentious question. What were you using? Is this a useful question to ask someone who has just overdosed? And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that it may be a useful question. The vast majority of street drugs these days um, contain what's advertised, but also contain other things as well. And I think, um, you know, it seems like about as often as not, I attend overdoses to people who have overdosed on thinking that they were using something other than opiates. Um, you know, uh, establishing, if, if you've resuscitated someone with naloxone, there was de facto, there, there have to have been opiates on board for you, you to have been able to resuscitate them. Um, whether or not they fully knew what was in the substance they were using is maybe not relevant. Um, and could sometimes, I suppose, be even regarded or, or, or perceived by some people as a bit of an accusatory question, right? So it's maybe a little bit more helpful to say, hey man, you know, or hey, hey, I'm, you know, I'm sorry this happened to you. Look, we're, we're trying to help you out today. Looks like you overdosed. We resuscitated you with naloxone. Um, there was some downer. There were some opiates in what you were using, right? Um, you know, it becomes a more useful question if we're talking about non-opiate overdoses. If we're talking about someone who's been taking pills or, um, you know, in an attempt at self-harm or, or something like that. Um, but in terms of resuscitating street overdoses, I don't, I don't think that this adds much, this question adds much to your clinical management of someone. Um, psychiatric and self-harm history. So uh, something we see, unfortunately, uh, with moderate frequency is uh, folks who have mental health challenges 
and folks who might be self-harming, either with uh, suicidality and intent to end their own lives, or uh, self-harm as a coping mechanism or, 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 or whatever else. I am not it by any means an expert on the, the psychology or psychiatry of self-harm and, and, uh, and, and suicidality. So if I get any terminology here wrong, please don't hold that against me. I am doing what I can to, or doing my best to, uh, to, to make sure that I'm using the appropriate terminology here in a respectful way. But if I get anything wrong, uh, it's my fault. Um, so stuff to ask, things to ask, what happened today, right? Um, folks who have maybe engaged in self-harm, either been cutting or taken some pills or performed other acts of self-harm. Cutting and pill taking are probably the two most common things that I feel like I see. Um, you know, very often um, people, uh, very often people will be willing to talk uh, about what happened and, and tell you. Sometimes they won't be, but it's important to, to remember that the person you're you're talking to has agency and, and is, is a person that you want to be talking to and asking these questions of. Um, you can ask bystanders or friends if necessary. Sometimes people don't want to talk to you. Sometimes people find it too painful or upsetting to uh, uh, to talk about what they've just gone through. It's a pretty upsetting event. Sometimes have, you know, leaving your partner to do some wound care for a second while you step into the other room and talk to a care provider or a friend or partner or whatever. Um, to get a more detailed history is, is the best way to find out actually what's going on. Um, it's important to ask people if they were trying to kill themselves or if they're trying to self-harm. Um, suicidality or suicidal ideation and suicidal intent and self-harm are very different things. Uh, and it's important to establish, were you trying to kill yourself today, yes or no? Um, were you trying to hurt yourself today, yes or no? Uh, and having that information, it doesn't change a lot for you, um, but it can be really important information for downstream care providers. It's gonna be one of the first things the hospital wants to know and paramedics wanna know when they get there. Um, for folks who, are, who have been cutting, um, were you only cutting in one place or do you have other injuries that need care, right? Um, many folks who are struggling with, with cutting as a form of self-harm, um, will have more than one site. Some folks or many folks will have just one site they're cutting at. Uh, the main reason you want to ask this is you want to make sure you're not missing anything, right? Um, you know, are there also wounds to your leg that I need to bandage up and dress up and have a look at? Okay, we can do that too, right? Or arms or, or whatever. Um, if someone's ingested pills, try and establish a clear history of what medications or what pills were taken, what time they were taken. So what time, how many, I should, I should have put that in there. It says, it says what pills, but what pills and how many and what time did you take them? If you have access to the pill bottles, um, having access to the bottles uh, can, can be very helpful, especially if there's prescription medications involved because they'll have a prescription date and you can often do a little bit of detective work and math and determine uh, you know, roughly uh, you know, what's the maximum number of, of pills that might have been available to this person to, to self-ingest. Um, and, and what, uh, you know, what are the potential complications um, from, from that level of dose uh, over the period of time that they've had those things on board. Um, I don't have the number up here, and I'm sorry, guys, but you should be able to Google this pretty easily for your, for your area. Um, poison control centers, either in BC or if we have folks from other provinces, poison control centers are excellent, excellent resources. They're, I've never had a bad experience with them. Um, don't hesitate to call poison control and have a chat with them and say, you know, look, I've got this person who's ingested this and this and this. I've got an ambulance on the way. Is there any treatment that I need to be doing in the meantime? And they might suggest inducing vomiting or drinking water or, or whatever. Um, but just remember that resource is there as well, right? Management and treatment. So we're done. Uh, we're done all of our sort of like helpful, useful questions. Management and treatment. Um, we're talking about history taking today. So we're not going to talk about management and treatment. I'm sorry, this, this presentation is long enough. That's a different topic for a different day. For ongoing care, right? You know, you sometimes, depending on how far away from hospital care you are or aren't, depending on how far away from 911 services you are or aren't, um, you may have time for some ongoing care, right? So use extra time that you may have to document your findings, dig deeper into relevant history and determine if there's any other help or support you can, uh, uh, you can offer your patient. Do try to have your documentation as ready as possible before paramedics arrive. So uh, if, uh, oh, we have someone from Pentic. Hey, I'm, I love to see folks from the interior here. Welcome. We'll get a certificate out to you tonight, uh, uh, Janelle. Um, so, uh, and Elizabeth, you as well. 
from Campbell River. Everyone's joining us. Um, so do try to take your time with ongoing care to have documentation ready, because when your paramedics show up to take your patient, um, uh, it's very, very, very helpful if you can have an ID card and a piece of paper to hand them, because as much as you're excited to talk to them and give them the whole story and everything, they don't want to talk to you for 15 minutes and get the whole story. They want to get the whole story on paper and leave. Um, you know, uh, a lot of paramedics, not everyone, but a lot of paramedics really want to minimize their scene time. They want to start moving towards a hospital with their patient um, and having that package ready to go. Here's your paperwork. Bye-bye. Um, is, is genuinely really, really helpful for a lot of crews. Um, which brings us to a handover to EMS. So a handover to EMS is 20 seconds to capture what's important as you talk to your paramedic, right? And there's, there's a bunch of stuff here that's actually quite important. And I've tried to, on this slide, capture a lot of the stuff that I see folks doing wrong or maybe struggling with a little bit is maybe a better way to put it. Um, you know, point number one, remember that your patient is a person and I put that in bold and underlined it for a reason, right? Um, and is also likely listening to your handover. Um, please remember that when you're talking about your person, say I'm handing over my patient named Sue, um, my paramedic, walk up, pa paramedic walks up to me and says, hey, what's going on? I say, well, we found her uh, lying, in, uh, lying in a puddle and we think she broke her ankle, right? That's not a helpful handover. Helpful handover is, this is Sue, she's 45. Um, we think we've got a, 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 we think she might have a, a fractured ankle. We did find her, uh, you know, semi-conscious earlier. Um, with an angulated and deformed left ankle, distal pulses are intact, other vital signs are unremarkable. We don't have a medical history for her um, because she's, uh, she's decreased right now. Um, I'll go through a couple more examples later, but try to remember that, you know, A, Sue is listening to you. And if there's anyone named Sue in here tonight, that's nothing, I'm, I'm not picking that um, particular, there was actually a Sue. Um, sorry, I tried to pick a name that I, that was not here and I might've failed at that. Um, but, um, but, you know, try to remember your patients, you know, probably listening, they have a name. It's helpful to have an age, right? Because an 85 year old who's fallen and broken an ankle is a lot different than a 19 year old that's fallen and broken an ankle. Um, try and use the standardized format for your handovers. Uh, SBAR, situation, background, action, and recommendations is a very common uh, uh, standardized format for handovers. It is not a requirement to use it, but if you're using it, you'll find that uh, you'll find that other folks are likely to understand it um, and find it helpful to, to have a standardized format. Um, make sure you convey relevant information up front. So again, patient's age, right? Um, a basic situation, basically what's going on, any major medical problems that the patient uh, suffers from. This is Sue, she's 85 years old. Uh, she has a history of, uh, of you know, three previous MIs. Today she's having chest pain that feels like her last MI. Okay, I've, I've got right off the bat, I've got a lot of information there. That's all very high yield information, right? Um, make sure you detail any unusual findings from today. So uh, um, yeah, anything that's, that's jumping out at you as, as being uh, particularly noteworthy. Um, this is David. David's uh, 32 years old. Uh, has come to us today complaining of uh, uh, complaining of uh, a paper cut on his finger. Um, but we also find him hyperventilating at a rate of about 30, uh, 32, and tachycardic at a rate of 132. We think there's a significant anxiety component to that, right? All of a sudden, you know, this isn't just a guy with a finger cut. This is a guy who's also got something else going on. So, you know. Tuck in your unusual findings as well. Make sure they're, uh, make sure they're there. So do's and don'ts for handovers. Um, do treat your patient like a person. Do try to paint a picture of what happened. I think I gave a few good examples of that just now. Focus on the immediate issues. Please don't, whatever you do, don't go rambling off about, um, you know, just because you had half an hour to talk to Betty Sue about her, her three-month history of gastric problems does not mean that the, the paramedics you're handing your patient over to want to hear about her three-month history of gastric problems. Just chart it and uh, you know, perhaps mention it in passing at the end of your report. Um, give only critical history. Again, you have 20 seconds really to capture what's important here, right? Um, most paramedics and most receiving nurses 
will have about a 10 to 20 second attention span, if that. Um, stick to the really important stuff. Mention the other stuff, uh, you know, later at the end in paperwork or documentation. Um, do mention any treatments that you've provided or drugs that you've given, right? So what have you done for your patient? What medications did you give them? If you gave them aspirin, if you helped them with their nitro or their EpiPen, if you gave them naloxone. Um, stick to what you've objectively observed, right? So don't go, this is David. He's having a diabetic event. Sorry, Dave, let me pick on you right now. You already outed yourself earlier. Don't, don't, you know, you found David. He's, he's, you know, he's collapsed in a corner. He's kind of gray and sweaty and you've given him some sugar and he's gotten better. You know, uh, your, your response is not, this is David. He's having a diabetic event. This is David. He's known to be a type one diabetic. He was found uh, slumped in a corner, looking pale, looking sweaty. It was a GCS of uh, three, five, six, 14 ish. Um, we gave them two packets of 15 grams of uh, glucogel each. So a total of 30 grams of glucogel about 20 minutes ago. And he's feeling much better now. So I have not said this is a diabetic event, but I've painted a picture for any competent clinician to recognize that this is very likely to be a diabetic event. Are there other possibilities? Sure. Maybe David was having a cardiac event and he just happened to, to uh, or having an, um, a uh, dysrhythmia or an arrhythmia event, and he just started to happen to, to um, convert out of it and feel a bit better around the same time we gave him his glucose, right? We can't rule these things in and out. We can talk about what we did, right? Focus on pertinent vital signs. Um, if you've taken every vital sign on your patient every 15 minutes for the last hour, um, we do not need to know what their temperature was every 15 minutes. We do not need to know that their breathing rate stayed 16 the entire time. We do need to know if their heart rate drops precipitously um, or if they've had a sustained tachycardia or if their blood pressure has been trending downwards or upwards, right? So a way to get around that is to say, you know, this is, uh, this is Sue. Um, she's come in complaining of chest pain. Her pressure when we first met her was about uh, 140 over 96 and has steadily dropped down to about a 92 over 40 now and has been trending downwards over the last hour, right? Um, we don't need to hear about her temperature. We don't need to hear about her pupil size unless they're relevant to today's complaint. Um, please don't, as I sort of gave an example earlier, please don't use pronouns without a name first, right? Your patients are people. There is no reason to talk about your patients as if they are not people. Um, they are people, they are not objects. Um, don't jump to conclusions. We just talked about this a little bit, right? Don't, uh, um, don't, uh, don't make too many presumptions. Have in your head, I think I am dealing with a diabetic. Absolutely, you have to have that because you have to be able to inform your clinical decision-making. But uh, um, it, you know, unless you have access to blood work and electrocardiograms, you're very unlikely to be able to say that someone is definitively um, suffering from thing A or thing B or whatever. Um, don't leave the scene without making sure the receiving crew has what they need. So don't just, uh, um, do you ask for pronouns? Um, I, I got to be honest, I personally am kind of terrible at this. Um, I'll normally go with what people are with what people are sort of openly presenting as, and then if I get corrected uh, or if I get an inclination that I should be doing something differently, I will. Um, is that a best practice? Probably not. Um, but at the same time, if I go and ask every 85-year-old that I meet what their pronouns are, 99% of the time, I'm probably going to irk and or confuse them. So there's a certain degree of balance in there. It's a good question. I don't have a good answer and I don't want to go down that rabbit hole right now. Um, please don't leave the, uh, don't, please don't leave the scene without making sure that the receiving crew has what they need. So don't just blah, 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 at your paramedics and then leave. Make sure you stick around, ask them if they need any more information, if they need any help getting the patient packaged, do they need any help carrying stuff whatever else is, is, is sort of reasonable to, uh, to offer. So I got a couple of examples for you guys. Um, three examples, I think, really fast, and we're getting very close to the end here. Um, as an example of a verbal handoff, right? This is Stephen. Stephen's 25-year-old male with type 1 diabetes. Today, he's had an unwitnessed collapse. Bystanders found him on the ground behind the Ferris wheel at the Saanich Fair with a decreased level of consciousness, and they called us. Uh, we find Stephen with no visible injuries, a GCS of 346 being 13. His other vital signs are unremarkable. We weren't able to measure his, uh, glucose directly, but we've presumptively treated him with 15 grams of glucogel about 15 minutes ago. His GCS has come up to about a, uh, 356 to 14, and he says he's feeling better. 
Um, we're just about to give him another 15 grams when you showed up. Would you like us to go ahead with that? And do you have any questions? Right. 20 seconds. This is Charles. Charles is a 79 year old gentleman who suffered three previous MIs, uh, most recently in 2018 when he had two stents placed. Today, Charles came to the first aid tent complaining of eight out of 10 retrosternal chest tightness that came on around 10 a.m. while he was walking around the fairgrounds. He says it radiates down his left arm, is worse when he exerts himself and feels just like my last heart attack. He's also complaining that he feels a bit short of breath. He's hypotensive at 90 over 50, has a heart rate of 64 and regular. We've laid him down on a stretcher, given him 160 of aspirin and called 911. Do you have any questions? Right? 20 seconds. In there. Last one. Uh, we've been called here for a suspected opiate overdose. Uh, and this is presuming that we're still working on resuscitating someone. This is sort of a uh, handoff you're giving while you're venting someone, right? Um, bystanders found this gentleman unconscious and apneic, lying supine on the ground with drug paraphernalia nearby. They performed CPR, a security guard called us over. Uh, we found this gentleman with a pulse, but still apneic. We've placed an OPA, been ventilating him for about 10 minutes, given a total of four doses of naloxone, so a total of 1.6 milligrams. Um, vents have been easy, effective. We've had no problems with the airway. Uh, do please be careful. We've, uh, we may still have some sharps on the ground nearby, right? Um, that's it, guys. That's the presentation. Um, I do, if anyone has questions, I've put together a handful of slides of helpful mnemonics um, that I have been taught or other people have shared with me over the years um, that might be useful for your own history taking and, and such. Um, does, anyone have, uh, does anyone have questions they want to chime in with or throw at me as we go through our slides of helpful mnemonics? This is our first helpful mnemonic. If anyone remembers 1995? No. Most of you guys are too young to remember this. Feels especially vain because I can't hear anyone laughing or groaning with all the microphones off. Um, any questions, guys? And I'm just going to scroll through these uh, without commenting too much. Um, these are all going to be available in the YouTube video when it gets posted later on. So if you guys want to come and refer to these later on, uh, they will be posted up there um, uh, for folks to refer to. Does that make sense to everyone? Does all that stuff, did that sort of make a bit of a coherent, uh, a coherent point? Anyone? Bueller? So just as this next, uh, just as this next uh, slide comes up, guys, uh, AEIOU tips uh, has a lot of information. This is a, a pretty common uh, mnemonic for, for recognizing or looking for causes of altered level of consciousness. Um, this has a lot of stuff in it. Um, this is obviously a very dense slide. Like I said, don't try and write this down now. This will be, uh, this will be posted later. <clears throat> So folks, if there's no questions, um, I, uh, we're going to wrap up. There's only two more, uh, two more little slides and mnemonics here um, for, folks to, uh, for folks to have a boo at. Um, thanks for coming again this evening, um, as always. Next week, we have, uh, we have Anna Stefik, uh, Division 176 SDS, uh, talking to us about uh, or giving us uh, case rounds and giving us simulated cases. So be able to, uh, you guys will be able to put some of this stuff hopefully uh, to use next week. Um, and uh, I hope we, uh, I hope we see a whole bunch of you. Uh, well, I see a couple of uh, great talks. Thank you guys. I'm glad. I hope this was useful. So it's a bit, uh, it's a bit difficult to 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 cram all this into a into a coherent topic. So I hope this wasn't, uh, I hope this wasn't too dry and or too dragging. Um, is our last slide here? The iChat acronym. Um, yeah, I hope we see everyone next week. Um, I hope you guys, I will get this video up, uh, later tonight. I hope, uh, possibly tomorrow morning at the latest, but, um, and I will get certificates sent out for everyone who asked for them. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I hope you guys are looking forward to an opportunity to put some of this to use, uh, next week with Anna's talk. And, um, 
Yeah, guys, I don't see a lot of questions. I see a bunch of people saying thanks. Uh, you're welcome. It's it's absolutely our pleasure. It's it's a, you know, uh, it's really great to be able to do this and sort of join the St. John community a little bit and, and uh, you know see a bunch of friendly faces and names and stuff from around the province and around the country. Um, uh, please tell your friends. Oh, I see a question. What's the word on in-person meetings starting? Uh, the word is there is no word. Um, yeah, the, the short version is there is no word that I'm aware of right now, um, unless uh, Ross, if you still happen to be here, if you want to chip in on that or Pete. But my understanding is we're still in a holding pattern and are likely to be until at least, I'd be very surprised if anything opens up before midsummer or late summer at the very earliest. Um, you know, uh, that's not official. That's just a shoot from the hip guess. Um, I see still September or until otherwise. Yeah, that, that was my understanding. Surely is like with the vaccination rollout going as well as it is, there's a possibility that it might be earlier, but I, I, I'm sure not going to count on anything. So we'll, uh, we'll find out when we do. Um, and I see Wayne asking for a certificate or win, win. Um, fantastic guys. I'm going to log everyone out here. I'm going to end the meeting. Um, and, uh, I, uh, I hope everyone has a fantastic evening and we'll look forward to seeing you guys next week.